The United Kingdom is not at its best right now. Following the Brexit negotiations, the disastrous management of the pandemic, and Liz Truss's tax reform that nearly sank the pound, the country is a complete mess. But let's be clear, the UK's problems are not new. Since the terrible financial crisis of 2008, the country does not seem to have got back on its feet. Since then, the UK's productivity gap with countries such as France, Germany, and the United States has more than doubled. To give you an idea about what this means, there are about 9 million people working in the UK right now who have never experienced a time when wages have increased every year. After 15 years living in chronic economic stagnation, British wages are the same as they were in 2005. And that explains news items like this. Six out of 10 Britons believe the country is going in the wrong direction. A century ago, London was the economic center of the world, the city with the most cutting edge companies. Today, Microsoft's market capitalization alone is greater than the market value of all the companies listed on the British Stock Exchange. And visual economic viewers, British society is starting to get fed up. Many voices are increasingly calling for a change in the country's direction. They are calling for realistic, politically saleable reforms that, as Trump himself would say, or as many international media outlets are already headlining, would make the UK great again making Britain great again. To come up with realistic solutions, it's first necessary to understand the problem, to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the British economy. Well, this is exactly what we are going to look at next. Are you ready? Let's get into it. The first crucial factor to the UK economy is the service sector. It accounts for 45% of economic activity and employs a third of the entire population. In fact, this country is the second largest exporter of services in the world. And what kind of services are we talking about exactly? Well, education for starters. Universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. The British education sector attracts more than 600,000 foreign students every year. As a result, British science produces more scientific papers than, for example, France and South Korea combined. Another thriving sector is finance. The city of London is still very strong. Even though following the 2008 crisis, its presence fell from 12% to 9% of GDP. Then there are the rest of the services sector, telecommunications, transportation, leisure. And the question is, why is all this important? Because many voices within the UK are proposing the country become an industrial power like Germany again, to leave aside the service sector and focus once again on manufacturing. Don't forget that it was was precisely in this country that the first industrial revolution took place. The problem is that these days, the German model would be very difficult to implement. Changing an entire economy to start mass producing competitive manufacturing is extremely complicated. To give you an idea, of the 10 products in which the United Kingdom had the greatest competitive advantage 50 years ago, seven are still on the list today. History matters, and matters a lot. In fact, Germany is a country with a lot of taxes, a lot of bureaucracy, and many social problems. But it is wealthy thanks to the fact that industrial companies like Siemens, Volkswagen, and Bosch have been gathering strength for almost a century. Germany is rich because of its history, and the UK cannot easily compete with that. And let's see, it's not that the British have a weak industrial sector. For example, they are specialists in the pharmaceutical industry and the manufacture of aircraft parts, where companies such as Rolls-Royce and the Airbus factories stand out. But this advantage is not something that could be expanded overnight. And that's not all either. If we look at which sectors have been the worst performers in recent years, we see that, in reality, British industry has been by far the worst economic sector of all, the one that is weighing most heavily on the country's productivity. This is not just a UK thing. In fact, Germany itself is having a lot of problems with its industrial fabric. It is becoming increasingly difficult to compete with Asian countries, even more so when energy costs have skyrocketed. In other words, if the UK wants to get back into the top tier of countries, it is probably best to improve services where it is is already competitive and forget about imitating the German model. The question is, what can be done to continue to grow along that path? First of all, there is a very obvious solution, free trade agreements. When talking about international trade, we are very used to dealing with physical goods, but services, which is precisely the star sector of the British economy, are often overlooked. And the problem is that the trade agreements that the UK has signed up to, and which are now even more important after Brexit, focus on trade in goods. And so the first step for make UK great again would be 
be to sign an agreement with the EU that would attempt to return to the pre-Brexit situation. One report estimates that a return to a similar situation could improve British GDP by 1-2%. to But the real challenge will be to establish treaties with other rich countries outside Europe, such as the USA, Japan, and Singapore. Even before Brexit, non-EU countries already accounted for 63% of services exports, an approach that explains new stories like this. UK signs first of its kind financial services agreement with Switzerland, UK businesses to provide financial services to the Swiss domestic market, and vice versa more easily. In any case, beyond the trade barriers, there is another problem that plagues the British economy, the lack of investment. As you can see in this graph, for several decades, investment has been losing more and more ground in the UK. In the 1990s, gross capital formation was higher than in Germany or the United States. These days, however, it is practically 30% behind. In the real world, this translates into fewer companies being created, fewer machines being acquired, fewer factories being set up. This reason alone is the main Achilles heel of the British economy. There is a lack of investors who put money to work developing the country's productivity, a problem that, yes, does plague other economies in the world as well, but as you can see in the graph, it is particularly worrying in the case of Britain. To give you an idea, if the UK private sector had invested as much as the German or French private sector since the pandemic, UK GDP would be 4% higher today, and the average wage would have increased by about £1,200 per year. And I know what you're wondering, why do the British invest so little money? Aren't they supposed to be a wealthy economy with a very sophisticated financial sector? Well, let's break it down. First, this drop in investment coincides with the beginning of some fiscal austerity in the United Kingdom. And no, it is not that austerity, as such harms investment or growth. Just ask the Swiss. It all depends on how you make the adjustment. The fact is that in many countries, and this case is no exception, politicians prefer to cut public investment spending rather than, for instance, spending on pensions. Everyone loves it when the government invests in basic science. But when push comes to shove, they'd rather vote to have a little more money at the end of the month. In the midst of a budget crisis, it is easier to cancel the construction of a bridge than to fire a nurse or raise taxes. What's more, contrary to what happens in other sectors of the economy, public and private spending tend to be complementary. This means that if you reduce public spending on R&D, private spending will also go down, which is exactly what has happened. This does not mean that increasing public spending is the solution. It simply means that shifting from public spending on investment to current public spending, such as subsidies or pensions, has negative effects on development. The second problem of the lack of British investment has been the enormous legal and political uncertainty that has existed in the country. Since the financial crisis, the UK has scored worse than Europe in this respect, but Brexit has boosted this indicator, and its effects are still lingering to this day. At the end of the day, if companies did not know whether they would be able to continue trading with Europe after Brexit, they were hardly going to risk losing multi-billion dollar investments. But that's not all. Another problem is that the regulations are very changeable and insecure. For example, since the 1980s, there have been 28 different major laws on such important aspects for a company as the training of highly qualified workers, as well as six ministerial departments and 48 secretariats in charge of regulating these types of practices, none of which has lasted more than 10 years. We are talking about a lot of regulations that are difficult to understand and are rapidly changing. It's a bureaucratic nightmare. It's an alphabet soup of regulators. Students are terribly confused about which programs are valued by employers, and no one has any confidence that a qualification will lead to work or a salary, progression, or even existence in a few years' time. Of course, all this has been compounded by the new environmental regulations and the net zero goal. Many economists see these regulations as a real economic engine that will drive investment in clean technologies, resulting in cheaper energy than that obtained from traditional sources. Even so, the problem is that at least for now, several reports state that these regulations are linked instead to a loss of productivity in the short term. For example, if a factory is required by law to install solar panels, while this will encourage the solar energy industry overall, in the short term, it will entail significant costs that will undermine the productivity of established companies. 
finally, another big reason for the lack of investment is that companies in the UK are not exactly the best run in the world. The UK is one of the richest countries with the lowest percentage of listed companies with a shareholder board that controls the CEO, less than 20%. To put it in perspective, in France, Germany, Italy, and Portugal, this percentage reaches almost 70%. In other words, managers have a free hand to decide. The reason? Because the ownership of these companies is widely dispersed. Put another way, in most cases, these companies are not part of a group large enough to oversee the CEO's decisions. And how does this translate into less investment? Think about it. CEOs are a bit like politicians. Many of them can prioritize business results, and especially stock market results, in the short term. Many of them receive bonuses in exchange for good results in the company. However, this encourages the achievement of short-term objectives, rather than the construction of a productive business model in the long term. At the end of the day, a CEO wants results now, not 15 or 20 years from now, when he or she will no longer be with that company. On top of that, another factor that may have an influence is that 50% of these companies are in the hands of foreign firms, which may prefer to leave a manager in charge, rather than manage them directly from above. However, this is not the only problem. Medium-sized companies in the UK are also finding it hard to grow and compete with large companies. In fact, it is in these companies that the productivity decline of recent years has been most concentrated, and part of the problem could be in their management. UK companies have half as much planning or assembly line monitoring software, and this is much more important than it may seem at first glance. Getting a company to have management with professional practices is connected with $15 million more in profits, 25% faster annual growth, and 10 times more investment in R&D. So, what solutions have been proposed? Countries such as Denmark and Sweden offer training programs for both managers and employees that seem to have a more or less significant impact in this regard. Singapore's Skills Future program is another great example of a public initiative that has made it easier for companies to catch up with new technologies to improve internal management. Other governments, such as the German government, have programs that offer loans to companies that need financing to digitize or carry out other management reforms. Loans that the traditional banking sector does not usually grant because they do not have any collateral. In general, the idea is to spread the diffusion of new technologies and management skills from the leading companies to the rest. Although, other prominent people in the country consider a different approach. If companies cannot be controlled from above by the shareholders, they should be controlled from below by the workers. And keep in mind that this is not a proposal that comes only from the most radical wing of the Labour Party. Far from it. Theresa May pledges worker representatives on boards of directors. If politicians really want to make chief executives more accountable, this is a common sense approach. I am willing to meet with Theresa May to discuss these proposals. And beyond all the solutions we have mentioned, moving from a tax system that taxes income to one that is more focused on penalizing consumption, like the Nordic countries, would improve the UK's savings rate, which is the third lowest in the OECD. <laughs> So, as a summary, we could break it down to three key points. Number one, the UK is a country specialized in high value added services, not in the industrial sector, and its economic plan has to take this into account. Number two, the country's main handicap is low productivity due to minuscule investment. And number three, the problem of underinvestment is complex, and there is probably no single measure that can solve it, but there are good first steps, such as reforming the tax system so as not to penalize either public or private investment. But at this point, what do you think is the main cause of the UK's loss of competitiveness? Do you think there is a country that could serve as a role model for the country to move forward? What other measures would you propose to get the UK economy back on track? You could leave me your answers down in the comments. And as always, if you like this video, like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best. See you next time.